going to go try to pick up a chunk right here. They're going to be defending low, and we're going to find a way. Quarterback scrambling. Gets the ball loose. Hi. <laughs> Uh, it is the iconic Mike Morielli laugh that makes us giggle every time we play that uh, clip of Pete Dajkowski doing play-by-play and very lucky now to have Mike Morielli of the Canadian Elite Basketball League joining us here on Marsh and Mel. Mike, it's good to catch up with you. How are things? Well, things are good, man. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in, in probably about a year. That's yeah. what it feels like, which may be right. Uh, it does feel a lot like that. The good thing is that you guys are getting ready to fire it up and try and return back to play again after being the first league in North America to actually get back out into your sporting venue. What you did, I thought, with the Summer Series last year in St. Catharines was spectacular. I became addicted to it. I was watching it on Twitch in my backyard. I remember watching basically like every day, 5 p.m. I'm like Ni- Niagara's playing or Hamilton's playing or Gulls playing or whoever I wanted to watch that day cycling through. I would get my workout gear, go onto the back deck like an idiot during quarantine, essentially, and then start working out with the TV connected to Twitch and watching Canadian basketball. It was super fun, but uh, I wanted you to give people an update here on the show today about exactly where you guys stand going into this year, what the plan is, because I actually, when the weather was about 13 degrees and sunny yesterday, we were out walking the dogs, and I turned to Marlene and I said, it kind of feels like when we went to our first CEBL game, it was the inaugural game that was down at first Ontario with the Hamilton Honey Badgers playing. I'm like, if, I'm already conditioned to know that when it gets a little bit warmer and the grass starts kind of thawing and turning to mush a little bit, I'm like, it kind of feels like CEBL season. Well, listen, thank you for thinking of me as you're out walking your, your, your dogs. With, <laughs> of with course. Family. I appreciate that. <laughs> but but you're right I mean we we feel the same way I think part of it is just being Canadian and the sun shines and it can still be you know in the teens and we're like yeah let's let's get going uh but we're working tirelessly over here um you know we're going to return in a more profound way uh, into our own markets uh, and back to our markets now again the fan side of it is still unknown but we didn't want that to stop us from from making that decision to return so we have met and discussed our protocols uh, with every province we plan, which is four of them right now. And we are at different stages of resubmitting based on initial conversations. And those will happen the end of this month and the beginning of April. And then from there, we'll get some more feedback. Um, and then in time for our June 5th start, which is about three weeks later than we typically do. But we did that on purpose to try to buy us some more time. Every day, you know, we hope is an advantage to us with vaccination rollouts, et cetera. But again, it, removing the fan part of it initially just it, it provides clarity, right? So my staff knows, no, we're going, we're going 100%. We're not hinging this on on fans in the stands. So that's been that's been great. The fact that we were able to pull off the bubble in that before obviously gives us more confidence. Um, but everything we're doing now and all the protocols you make, the interesting part is you're making the protocols based on today. So you know, my hope is that. Many of the protocols that are in place today, we won't have to deal with, um, you know, two, three months from now. But, you know, you want to be at that highest, uh, you know, level of, of concern and safety. And so far, so good. You know, it's interesting, Mike, because Marsh and myself were having a conversation a few weeks ago about how the second season of the CBL, you guys kind of got robbed from, you know, fixing and improving on things that happened in the first year when you didn't know what you didn't know because you were starting fresh. Now coming back for a third year, whether fans are in the crowd or not, are you excited now that maybe you have a better grasp on new things that you're implementing or changes that you're implementing? Yeah, you know, we, we started a lot of those implementation at our summer series last year, you know, the, the use of the Elam ending yeah. um, and, and just other things, you know, technology wise, uh, et cetera, that we we felt was a great opportunity to try. So as much as you know, the pandemic has hurt us incredibly, as it's hurt everybody um, in terms of you know from a revenue perspective, we haven't stopped investing in the league. So you know, in addition to what we were able to do last year, obviously uh, Elon will be coming back, and now that we're in our arenas and hopefully in front of fans, that adds another dimension to the whole ending and, and the importance of it and the fun aspect of it. Uh, but we've also are, are you know invested in a new OTT platform, so we're creating our own content, we're housing our own content. We'll launch that officially just before the start of the season. So not only are we taking advantage of of our our clientele and our fans domestically, but all over the world, because we know that basketball is a global game. We know that our athletes are the highest and best athletes on their respective teams overseas. So there's already an awareness factor there. And we want to look to continue to grow our international side of what we're doing. So things are moving in the right direction, Uh, albeit, you know, we're, we're, fighting and scraping and fighting our way there. Uh, 
because of the pandemic. But uh, at the same time, we're not taking our foot off the gas. Being able to grow internationally, obviously, is a priority for you. But harnessing the talent domestically in Canada, I know, is a priority from day one. Get the best guys to come back from wherever they're playing and take part in Canadian basketball played in Canada. And I've actually really enjoyed, Mike, that I see, whether it's names like JV Mokama or Johnny Brahim Maskell that I saw re-signing with the Ottawa Blackjacks, I think, today. And when you go through some of the names, every time I get the email blast from the CEBL, I go, damn, they got another, like there's another and another and another coming back. Do you have to sell these guys much at all on coming back, especially in a pandemic situation? Or does it sell itself at this point where the league is already established after two seasons of play? Yeah, we, we are very fortunate. You know, we've done a lot of work to get to the point where the trust factors get built up. And, and these players understand that they're coming to a legit league that can offer them something in return and something more than just money. Uh, the opportunity, the chance to become more aware in, in your own, you know, your own, your own country and your own market, um, but also the improving of, of a game, of the FIBA game, playing at the highest level within Canada, playing at you know arguably the, the best FIBA league that plays in the spring and summer, the best league in North America, and having that international exposure as well. So we're seeing players that started with us in 2019 that are no longer with us. We've replaced probably 75 new players in 2020. We imagine we're going to get a bulk of those guys back again and replace other ones. So the talent level goes up. I, I get the contracts. I'm sitting on a bunch of them that will be announced soon. But we are having, again, NBA caliber, NBA draft picks, uh, massive G League stars, um, NCAA stars from major institutions. They will all become part of the CBL you know, because of what we built, but also because of what this country offers in terms of a safe place to go uh, with a great health system, with, with you know, all the, the comforts of being in North America and what that brings with it. So, you know, it's a destination. The time in which we play is, is the secret sauce uh, and how we operate and how we take care of our athletes is, is the other part of it. But yeah, the trust factor is huge and, and thankfully we've gained it. Now we have to continue to keep it. I want to touch on something you said before about a commitment from ownership across the league. And I think that's something that you guys have a lot of like with the Canadian Premier League, right? Where, you know, Bob Young and all those guys went to ownerships and said, hey, this isn't a five year, you know, thing. This is, you know, for the long term. And there are going to be bumps and bruises along the way. Obviously, nobody saw the pandemic coming, but now, Obviously, that means something more than ever, that commitment to the league and that commitment to growing the game of basketball in Canada. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, we are a single entity ownership, uh, which actually makes a lot of our decision making yeah. even, even easier and quicker. And, and we're very nimble in that regard. But we are adding new uh, external partners as we speak. So I'm working on, on, on new franchises. Uh, right now, which will bring another uh, amazing group of, of business people to the CBL that'll help us grow uh, not only at the team level, but at the league level. But we do have shared aspirations, and I think that's important, and we know who we are. Um, and, you know, we've been able to withstand the, the pandemic uh, to a certain extent, to a really good extent, because we're all in. And, uh, and that togetherness, like, like you see in the CPL, you know, allowed us both to return uh, to play during a pandemic and, and to do it successfully. And we'll help we'd be, you know, another stepping stone on both of our growth, uh, you know, strategies uh, as we move forward. If a red bird capital came to you and said, uh, Hey Mike, we would like to take all of, uh, of your teams and we want to play American style and uh, screw this FIBA <laughs> BS that you guys have created here in the CEBL. Uh, but you get a bunch of our money. Are you, uh, are you biting in on that or what? Not a chance. It, it's just <laughs> not it's not the focus. It's not why this league was built. I, you know, I'd be a sellout. I would be a hypocrite because I don't believe that that is a smart strategy for, for many uh, groups that may be looking down that path. Yeah. And I obviously leading you into just a quick bite here on the CFL XFL discussion. And uh, I've been really amazed by the conversation that we've all been forced to have because this was all premature. There's nothing that we actually have in front of us that's happening, but for you, when you see the initial report of talking about talking, as Commissioner Randy Ambrosi says, and everybody starts to frenetically get concerned about the loss of Canadian culture and what this game means, uh, it is concerning, but at the same time, we don't have enough information. I'm just wondering what you think this actually means big picture, because obviously the specifics of it, you're slightly busy sitting on all those contracts you have to get out for the CBL. <laughs> 
No, but I'm, I'm keenly interested on many levels, right. you know, obviously as a, as a player, alumni, fan, you, you know, uh, re- reporter, or radio host, whatever you want to call it, and, and a, you know, a fellow kind of commissioner, um, the, the communication is key. And, and communication, vague communication or communications that, that's not complete does lead for this discussion. Now, it may be a strategy. Um, that is being being used to to find out what's really important. I, I don't think we that that's necessary. I think we pretty well know what's important to, to the fans of the CFL. Um, and in by doing by leaving things open, you're going to bring other people into the conversation that maybe don't understand the league as well as others do, and they'll have opinions that may be contrary, but don't understand the dynamics of what has made this work. So um, I'm keenly aware and interested in what's going on. I would say I'd have some level of concern because I am a fan and, and I want to see the continuation of, of what has been built over a hundred plus years. Um, this league has reinvented itself. I don't know how many times I lived through it in the nineties uh, of teams coming and going and, and U.S. expansion. I went to the U S I played games in the U S it was fun as a player, but it, I'm not sure it was, you know, I feel good seeing the Baltimore name on the great cup uh, when, I, when it gets passed around. Right. So um I understand the need to grow. I understand the need to hold on to, to what is culturally significant. And that's going to, I think is going to be the battle in the long run. You know, Mike, it's interesting because Marsha and myself, when we were talking last week about CFL XFL talks, one of the biggest things for me was to keep the CFL uniquely Canadian, because that's what drives fans to watch the CFL because it is ours. And then I was thinking, you know, amateur athletes as well, you know, what's the motivation for you sports football players, if they don't have a professional avenue in Canada, you came from that CIS U sports model, how important is it for you to keep that going and keep amateur sports in this country's, you know, thriving um, in, in the middle of maybe the hardest time that we've ever seen? Oh, it's incredibly important that, you know, the pipeline um, is right here in Canada. Uh, that is really has been the backbone of the Canadian Football League for forever. Uh, like it or not, some people may think, well, that's a downgrade to to other players from other countries. So I don't see it that way. Uh, I play against and play, sorry, played against, not anymore. Uh, you know, <laughs> guys that came from major U.S. Division One colleges that, you know, went up against me. I did not see a difference. Um, you know, the whole level uh, is raised when you get to the, the pros. So you, you know, the, you would assume that the cream of the crop is the ones that get the opportunity to, to go do it. And, and football in Canada at that level has improved dramatically, far better than when I played, including, you know, at me. There are far better players now that have built a, a career or going to build a long career, we hope, uh, in the CFL. So, you know, I look at it from a kid sitting in the stands at everyone's stadium wanting to be on that field because there were real realistic opportunities for me. And that drove me my my whole time, you know, in my football career at the amateur level and the high school level, et cetera. And that's what we're trying to replicate here with the CBL. We're, that's why we do a partnership with youth sports, because that is the breeding ground. We want people to stay here. They may choose to go to the NCAA and go that route. and That's fine. But we want to pr- prove that there's a legitimate pathway to the pros within your own country that means something. So that's the part that is, you know, and, and I saw Jim Mullen's comments uh, and they are, they're on point. I mean, there should be concern at that Football Canada uh, national level of, of what's going to happen if things change in a drastic way. And, and again, we're all pontificating because we don't know because there's been no clarity. And I think, you know, everybody has opinions. Um, until there's more clarity, it's, it's hard to, uh, to choose a side. Yeah, and I think the the thing I've taken away because I've been thinking about this endlessly, almost as much as you on my dog walks, Mike, is that I'm uh, I'm just trying to to parse together what we really know and what is opinion and what is just being floated that is reckless. And for me, until I know more, the only thing I know for for real is how much I love Canadian football and how much I love Canadian football players playing Canadian football. And I I got this message the other day from somebody in U Sports. A bunch of people have messaged and. and kind of voice their concern about do they have any idea what they're contemplating actually doing here because you're you're selling out every level of football if there's any sort of merger that gives up the canadian fabric of what's been built as you say over 100 plus years and this person said how many canadians do you think would play in the canadian football league or the xfl if there was some sort of merger uh if there was not a ratio rule and my response was maybe 10 and then immediately 
you know, I told Derek Taylor this and he said, if that, maybe 10, I mean, you wouldn't get to see that. And then the idea starts to come up. Okay. So now we don't have Mike Morielli's that are in our communities that are alumni of the CFL that are going back, that are giving back to the events that you do with the tie cats that are being seen out in public. And you yourself, just by being a member of a local community, you are promoting the CFL product because people remember you from when you played and when you wore the black and gold. And when you lose all of that, what the hell are you? Like, that's the thing I keep, that's the only opinion I can have at this point. That's genuinely how I feel. Well, connection to community is the single most important factor, um, I think, with any team or league and, and, and what the CFL has done better than any other league in its history, right? They, they have a, a bunch of players, American and Canadian, that have invested into the community uh, because they know it's important. They think it's important and it's proven to be important. It, you know, it's something that the CFL, the flag they have, you know, waved for years was access to players, 4,000 hours of community service, you know, this, this, and this. So yes, that, you know, in your, your way of describing it, it could create a massive void where you're void of all that, you know, what was cool about it, which was, Hey, I went to school with that guy, or I know he lived on my street or, or my parents knew him or, or whatever, or saw him play in university. Um, it doesn't diminish, you know, the other players, the American players, um, it, the American players have been a, a massive compliment to the CFL and in a welcome compliment, some of my best friends um, and, and teammates, but it is inherently a game that's been created here that uh, we're proud of. And there's not a lot of things we're proud of sometimes, you know, in this country. And, and this is the CFL is something I'm incredibly proud of and always will be uh, it, it, because the history is there and it's been proven over and over. Yeah. When you say a tremendous compliment, it also makes me think of it almost as an ecosystem where it's like, it's been living in a delicate balance for a long time. And then the idea of taking a huge part of that balance, and just removing it, it's like, well, what does the ecosystem become and how does everything survive? So uh, before you get into the Canadian Football League, though, of course, you went through the draft and the combine. I'm writing an article this week on CFL.ca about the combine and combine stories. And I've, I've periodically talked about this with different people around the league, but Man, it has changed a lot over the years. And you were one of the people that I always think of when I, I go into a CFL combine in 2018. You know, it's CFL week and we're in Regina or Winnipeg, wherever we were. And it's standardized testing and the turf is laid down inside and it's very official. And the team meetings are set up in the hotel and they're all lined up and there's only 15 minute blocks. And there's so much stuff that has changed over time. But I want to know, take me back into your combine experience and what it was like and how you experienced that whole kind of moment in your development. Well, that was, that's taken us back now. That was 1994, but I think things were drastically different uh, <laughs> in, from what we see today. Cause I've, I've been to those combines uh, Marsh and seen the, how the level has improved dramatically. I mean, it is a professional, true professional event. I would say it wasn't quite that way in 1994 as we went to uh, Winnipeg in the dead of winter um, to put on a clinic in front of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the same, probably many of the same people that are still in the CFL right now, to be honest <laughs> with that. Um, inside a golf dome um, with, you know, the indoor outdoor carpet that you would see at Canadian Tire and maybe not even at that good of a shape. But um, we stayed at the Viscount Gort, which no longer exists, thankfully. It was not the greatest hotel. We were all kind of crammed in there. Uh, there was no money at that time for lunch, uh, which came just before we had to do our testing. It was cheeseburgers and McDonald's. Oh. Um, when we did our when we did our vertical test, it was against the steel girder that just happened to be holding up part of the um, the structure for the golf dome. So you know, we had guys bumping into the girder and, and you know hitting themselves and doing whatever. Um, and you know the, the lunch obviously doesn't sit well as you're trying to run a forty or a shuttle on. You, you couldn't wear turf shoes because there literally was no, no, nothing to dig in. And if you were running shoes, you just z zipped on by. Um, it was an experience I'll never forget. Let's put it that way. It, it, it reminds me of the old Tom Brady picture from his combine when he's standing there in his bad, bad undershorts. That's what it <laughs> felt like. Um, you know, it, but it, the whole thing felt that way. So we had a blast. You know, I was there with a lot of great guys um, that went got on to get drafted. Trevor Shaw was there uh, with me as well at, at, at the Hamilton. And it was a fun time. But boy, uh, I ended up live, leaving that uh, combine, running our one-on-ones again against on the, the worst, uh, you know, 
turf ma- imaginable, fell down, busted my elbow. I still got a chip bone on my elbow that has never healed because of that. And it just was, it was what I came to expect as professional. That was my first experience. And um, I was shocked to say the least. And I'm equally as shocked now to see the improvements that have been made. A combine, what specific test were you looking forward to? Because you were like, I might be slow, but my vert's going to be really good here. <laughs> I was looking forward to one-on-ones. I know okay. that nobody was going to push me around. I was going to big body everybody. And that really, you know, quite frankly, is probably what got me drafted. I think I ran like a 4.72 or something like that. And my shuttle was decent. My, you know, I don't even think they have records from that day. Marsh, you would know. I, I think they started maybe in the Back 2000s. To, I think 01 is the earliest yeah. CFL official combine numbers that I have. Yeah, so I can I have it somewhere that I got a copy of something in some box in my basement. One day I'll find it and share it with you. But um, yeah, the one on ones for me were, were my entry point where I knew I'd excel. Uh, all the other stuff was was hit and miss, even for the guys that knew they could run well. Uh, yeah, it's it's funny hearing you say about the results and the earliest that exist because I remember somebody from the league telling me a couple of years ago that um, the I said, why don't we have records before 2001? They said, well, they were handwritten. Like we yeah. would sit, we'd sit at the finish line with a pencil and you would write them out. And then when you finish, you just hand them to somebody go, here's the combine results. Because of course the internet digitization of all, all data and information systems had not really happened. That wasn't standardized yet. And even pulling the stuff from the early two thousands, Mike is like pulling teeth, trying to get any oh, yeah. information to have it actually in a digital format. It's basically like a, somebody decided one day, man, maybe we should start keeping this stuff. And they scanned a piece of paper that has all these handwritten yep. notes all over the top of it. But once the combine was done, uh, what was that like? I mean, you're, you're at the end of it because wasn't there a story about you? Did you guys go out? Did you go for dinner, oh, being around all those guys? What happened there? Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, if you're going to have that many guys together, you know, and you just finished a bunch of testing and you're all nervous about what's happening next, the best thing to do is hit a club or a bar and, and figure it all out. So, uh we definitely did that. I'll never forget like how freezing cold it was and, and going outside and, you know, in, in Winnipeg, they, they don't salt the roads. They sand the roads. There was literally oh, mounds yeah. of sand had to be that high guys were wiping <laughs> out over top of them and uh, we're over the bar trying to grab pictures of beer and just, you know, we're, we had a great time. Vince Danielson, funny enough, was my roommate uh, who went on to have a great career uh, in, in Calgary slot back. And we were kind of, you know, I think he might've been the first receiver drafted or might've been the first pick overall, but you know, we roomed together and then, you know, he left before me and ended up taking my pair of my jeans or something, which I still haven't gotten back. And uh, you know, we just, it was fun, you know, amidst all the stuff that we laughed about and uh, you know, all the kind of uh, how terrible of an experience it was from, from a testing point of view, but we used that as a, as a chance to get together. And uh, I had a, a big handful of people went on from that uh, that combine to, to have good long careers so uh, it was a fun thing to be part of could you even you know fathom going into a combine without playing the previous year like these kids are um, in U sports because that's got to be super tough yeah that that is incredibly tough um, you know because you'll you'll understand you know football is a game of repetition right and it, you you have to kind of get out there you can you can train all you want and sure from a testing point of view you know you can probably get by because you're straight line testing and etc but when you have to now line up and do one-on-ones or or um you know do stuff that tests your football skills right in real live bullet situation it comes with repetition and you'll see that in a normal um, you know, combine, it takes a few go arounds to get the legs under guys and to get the awareness and the pads on. So to be stagnant for, for a whole year, and not have that, that playing ability, um, even for the pro guys, even for the CFL guys, there's going to be a level of time it takes to get back into it. You can't just step out there and do it. Um, so I feel for them, um, you know, it, it's an incredibly difficult time for everyone and, and uh, let's hope that they can bring it to the table and it, and it works out for them. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, thank you for fitting us into your busy schedule. We do appreciate it. Let people know where they can find everything CEBL so they stay up to date on everything you guys have moving forward into your third season. Yes. Yeah, please. You know, social media is kind of our bread and butter. So CEBL League 1L um, is the place to find us. And from there, we, you can you can go wherever you want across all seven teams and lots of great stuff coming. 2022 is going to be big for us, but let's get 
2021 started the right way. And, and guys, you're doing a great job as always. I, I love how you reinvented yourself. You look exactly the same. It's, it's a nice reinvention. I thought, I, was, I thought I was more jacked. I've been carrying around a 20 pound baby in a single arm for about six months. I, now. I, about- I know. I've yet to see that baby. And I'm, I, congratulations once again. Uh, Kyle looks fit as anything. So yeah, was, it's I got to give props where it is. Kyle's looking great. Kyle's glowing. I look ragged because I don't sleep. <laughs> that, that's what this is. So uh, Mike, thank you for everything, brother. We really do appreciate it. And it's always great to catch up with you. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. Thanks, Mike.